do we need great leaders in schools or do we need great managers? To be honest with you, we actually need both. One of my favorite definitions when you're thinking about this is from Stephen Covey. And he says, leadership is about people. Management is about stuff. And ultimately what that means is that you can have a vision. You can talk about all the things that you want to actually do. But if you don't actually figure out how to put the things together to support your people, to create time, to um, think about your budget, to find resources, it's really hard to do those things. And so that misperception, the idea that it's either you're a leader or a manager is something that I think really needs to be debunked. And in this great conversation with Brad Gustafson, he talks about the, the really powerful things that are happening in the school, how he really leads with heart and the focus on connection. But we also discuss how he's actually found ways to make sure that his teachers have what they need to be successful beyond that support. It's not that relationships don't matter in schools. They are the most important thing, but they're not the only thing. And it actually allows us to go further when we build those relationships, but where are we going to go? And that's why leadership and management are actually both crucial skills we have to develop in our schools. Brad is a great example. I hope you enjoy the podcast. I love talking with him. He's an awesome friend, a a great leader, and I think you're going to learn a lot from him. I hope you enjoy it. everyone, this is George Crows with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I got my good friend, Brad Gustafson, and we have had many conversations over the year. We actually first met uh, through social media. Brad is an amazing, amazing principal. He's an amazing thinker. He's actually one of the most complex thinkers I've met in education, but what I love about him is he does it in a space where he makes it simple, attainable, and makes me understand it, which is, you know, not always easy to do, but he does it from a place of love. He's someone that I know cares truly not only about his students, but his staff. Uh, When he talks about his staff, and this is something that I, why I'm really proud to be a good friend of Brad, is he makes me want that for my own kids because he talks so glowingly about them. And I know that is like authentic. I don't feel he's just saying it to be nice, but he truly loves his staff. And for me, um, one of the big shifts that I've really been working on myself in education is really understanding when we do what's best for kids, we, we do what's best for the adults in the space because they are the ones that were closest. And Brad is the embodiment of this, which is why I appreciate him, why I love learning from him. Uh, he's also an accomplished author. He's an accomplished speaker. He does a ton of great things. He's also someone I really look up to. I've always said this about Brad, that if I could put my kids in a school, Brad's would be one, which is, I think, the highest compliment I could give to any educator. Um, And there's only, you know, it's something that's a very high standard for me. So Brad, thanks for taking the time to be on the show. But also, um, we want to know like a little bit about your career in education. So kind of where did you start in education? What are you doing right now? Awesome. Thanks a lot, George. That means a lot. So I started as a second grade teacher, basically a little bit of time at first grade and just thoroughly loved it. I never thought that I would ever become a principal, nor did I aspire to. And then one day my principal walks into the room and had a a brochure to a college. She's like, I think you should look into this. And my response was kind of like, am I doing something wrong? Am I not like good enough at this thing? And eventually like I just, I kind of a nerd and love learning. So that's actually why I even pursued that. Um, But I wanted to kind of say, and I don't know if it's correcting the record, I feel like one of our first interactions, uh, I suppose we probably connected on social media first, but really early on, we were at a conference together. I I think you probably just got done keynoting and and crushing it. And I had a little little session in the corner on the street. And, uh, but we were talking (laughs) about the topic I was about to present on, and you were asking really good, important questions, pushing back. And I'm like, oh, goodness, you know, do I really believe now exactly like before I submitted the proposal compared to like walk into that room. So it was funny going in there and and having the conversation and then you were nice enough to be in the room. And I just had to, you know, authentically share what I believe, but also be honest with like how my thinking was evolving on on that. I think it was kind of along the lines of branding or marketing your school. It was on school branding. I remember that. So that was like, so 
I knew you before. We did, but that was like, so that was what I remembered as a really, like we sat and talked for a good amount of time before I went and presented. And I just loved, and you've consistently done this for, for years and years and years, anytime we talk, like, and I don't know how well people know this or see this, but you ask like really insightful questions that, that push people's thinking and you listen and it's like, it's one of many traits, but I really, really value that because not everybody does that. And it pushes me to think and justify and sometimes even evolve on, well, yeah. on, the, rare, on the rare occasion when you're right. Yeah. And, and that, I think, you know, at the time we were talking about um, school branding and things like that. And I, I can't remember the conversation. I can't remember, but yeah, I wanted to, and this is something um with me and I know this and I know a lot of people could share like I barely knew this guy he just starts going at me right there there is a for me to do that uh there is a certain level of comfort that I have knowing you to share that and obviously a certain level of respect because I wouldn't just do that to just I, like I know I shouldn't say that because I've done it before to people I don't know but I am really thoughtful because I want to get in those conversations right I think it's really good that we learn to challenge one another. Um, but as you said, I didn't say like, Oh, that's stupid and take no, off. No. I'm like, Hey, I'm gonna sit in your session. I want to hear about it. I want to see what you're doing. And I actually remember you were nervous. I could remember of course. that because like, <laughs> I just started going at me like, I didn't even wait till you started talking in the session. I remember because we were standing literally outside the door. Right? <laughs> so yeah, we we're pretty close. And you to the must door. have thought I love this George guy. He just is the best. <laughs> no, I mean, on, I, I brought it up, George, because honestly, my takeaway, like I appreciate, like even right now as a principal, right. and I, I suppose I wasn't always like this, right. like I might be scared of pushback or feedback, even if it's like presented crappily, like I yeah. don't even know if that's a word, yeah. uh, but there's always like truth and things I can learn from it. You didn't do it that way. You like, it was just a deep dialogue. And I, I mm -hmm. love that. Like that's like, there are people around and where I get to work that are just so honest and we can have like honestly child-centered conversations about stuff that really actually matters and i i feel like um we can just throw it out there and that that you know i know how i receive it i don't i'm not people here and they know that sometimes it takes me a day or two to come around yeah. and i won't always be able to say the smartest or best thing right away i might fumble around a little bit but they know that i will circle back and be like yeah. and i do this with deb at home too like she uh my wife just is so wise, you know, she'll share insights or things and I may be reluctant or right away, right away I'm seeing it differently, but give it a day or two. And I'm like, I'm willing to admit when someone sees something differently and, and the merits of what they're sharing, put it that well, way. And that's one thing that I've really been focusing on lately. And I think I really appreciate about you is you're very deeply reflective, right? So I know, and this is some of the best relationships I have and I appreciate being challenged uh, as well, is that I need some time to process, I need some time to think, but I, I always have struggled with like the, you know, you know, let me let me think about that. And it's used as a tactic to like never address it ever again. And I, I can kind of tell when that's happening. I've seen it, to be honest, with you um, working in central office, like, hey, that's like a really interesting idea. Let's like come back to that, which it's like, no, I, I, I don't I'm not interested in it. And this is I just hope you forget. Right. So I think that's funny. The one thing you said, I think is pretty hilarious is the idea that someone said, Hey, you should, you know, look into this because they thought you weren't a good teacher. Cause that is the perception of some teachers about what their principals is like, Hey, yeah, they're probably just being a principal because they sucked as a teacher. Right. Like that is a perception. And so and I was more, mine was more <laughs> out of being naive. It wasn't any right. calculated <laughs> assessment, but it was more like, I love, like right. what I'm doing and never like had never even considered anything different. So then I'm kind of like, it was just a little bit of a shell shock. Like why, <laughs> like, yeah. what's going on here? Well, and what, and that's, that's actually interesting. Cause I, I, I fell into admin not having an interest in doing it. And the first AP job I applied for, I got. And the only reason I applied for it was because uh, my principal pushed me at the time to do it. And I wanted other leadership opportunities, but I had no interest in being a school administrator. And uh, about two days in to being an assistant principal, I'm like, I want to be a principal. Like, I, I love this. This is something that, um, and, and she saw something in me. And I think that I got a, the job in the interview because it was a, 
a job that opened in the middle of summer. And I don't think people were looking like people kind of are committed to those jobs. And so I think I just got lucky that nobody applied. <laughs> so I was like, kind of just, you know, one of the few that applied and luckily got the job. So Brad, um, you're uh, in, 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 uh, in the US. And where is your school at with like, what have you been doing in your, is it kindergarten to grade? Yeah, we're K-5 school. We're in Minnesota. And so and what, we're, what's, what's like, what are you been, like, did you go remote last year? What's going on right now? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, our, our district is kind of done. It feels like each model. We've had some hybrid learning. It's based on numbers and just what we're seeing and the more we're learning about COVID. So we've had the hybrid, you know, the every other day thing. Now we're bringing kiddos back. Our K-2, our youngest learners are back mm -hmm. every day. And then 3-5 is coming back really soon. And But we do have a segment of our kiddos who are distance learning. That right. was their parent option. So we got that going on. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on. And so what's like, what's the best thing you've seen like out of this? I know you're a very innovative thinker. I know your staff is very forward thinking. So like, what have you seen that you'd say like, hey, this is a great uh, process of what we're doing? Or is it, you know, and I, like, I'd be okay if you said, no, it's actually only been struggles because I can, I can feel that too. But like, just trying to help people see some examples of things that they could be doing right now. Yeah. So this is where like, I'll use the, the, the thought or the concept that relationships are results. Sometimes yep. we, you know, so one of the things that I'm like learning and experiencing and just having gratitude for is listening to how, how hard this is for people. And quite honestly, all stakeholders, it's hard for a lot of kids. It's hard for a lot of families, hard for, a lot of teachers. Um, but like what I'm learning and one of the best things I've seen is that it's, we can be real. We can have that conversation and not just say, it's going to be okay. It's going to be great. Right. You got this. Cause that actually, when things are super hard for people, that's kind of dismissive and not really honoring how hard it is. So I've just thought I find and really find myself cherishing more and more just the relationships. And I, I don't want to sound cliche cause it's actually so powerful. And I, like, I think it's a reason or one of the reasons that I'm here right now is that the, like you said earlier, and I think, I think most educators probably feel this on some level, like these are people that, um, like I, I would do almost anything for, and the, we're going through this really hard thing together, but there's something beautiful in that too, because we're able to be real about that and sometimes cry and other times really laugh, but just listen. And I know like, here's a cool thing there are things that I will say often because like positive redundancy. And so one of those is just using the word meaningful, like let's do, let's do meaningful work mm -hmm. together and we'll interpret rules and safety recommendations and, and mandates, but we'll do it in a meaningful way. And that allows us to be child centered and teacher centered, which I'm learning more and more is like actually a really powerful productive thing. Right. Um, but I, it came back to me, George, it was a really stressful time just with so many things going on, changing learning models. And so I'm on Zoom with a core group of teachers. It was like a sub subcommittee work kind of thing. And I just was kind of melting down. For me, it was a meltdown. Other people might have thought it was just a norm. Like, he doesn't seem to whatever, you know, I wasn't like throwing things, but I was just like, we got to do this. Like, we got to do this. And uh, they're like, Brad, it's gonna be, it's gonna be okay. We will do this in a meaningful way. And they, like, they, they didn't judge me, and I felt safe, like being not perfect because it wasn't my best moment. But I also felt really, really reassured that we have teachers and teacher leaders who, like, this just saying the word meaningful isn't something we just toss around lightly. We're actually gonna do it. And in that moment, I could trust them, like, this is gonna be okay because they're gonna guarantee that we get this kind of this important work done in a meaningful way. So I don't know if I gave that story justice at all, George, but that was a really beautiful moment for me knowing that like the things that leaders say, whether it's a mantra or a core belief that you trust or that you say openly and, and often, like that can be a really important thing that actually will boomerang someday if you're open to it and actually help you out when you're not there or when you're needing that reminder. You know, I think one of the things that uh, resonates with me and what you're talking about. And I think why you kind of have that relationship is we do have to share when we're struggle in that leadership position too. And like, I, I just sent an email out um, to, you know, the people that connect with me through like my email list. 
And I just said, look, I, right now I am, and these are not people that work for me, right? These are people that just connect with me, you know, through my books and social media and stuff like that. I said, right now I'm just, I, I'm just over this. This is like too much. I feel like I'm just struggling and there's nothing, there's no certain element that's coming on that's doing this. It's just, I'm frustrated. I'm struggling. And so if this email doesn't, you know, isn't meeting the need, you know, the expectations that you have from what I share with you, I kind of wanted just to be open and upfront about that. And the responses that I got to that was so like people reaching out to me and checking in and making sure I'm okay. But there was also like, I just needed to hear that. I needed to hear that I'm not alone in this too. And I've never been one to like put on a brave face in the sense that like, I want to do good things and I want to be positive, but I don't ever hide from my emotions um, and don't pretend that I'm happy when I'm struggling. Right. And I think what I've become better at, and I know, you know, from what you're sharing too, is that it's important to share when we struggle. It's important to have those moments. And I think it makes, I feel sometimes when I was in a minute and I don't know what your thoughts are on this, is when I'd say, hey, I, I totally screwed that up, that I got like a way better response than when I did things right, right? Like it was like, oh, okay, so you're not, because it was almost like people just felt like, you know, I don't know if, if they just appreciated that I was willing to share failures. I don't know. Like, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you're, I mean, so right. Like that's, like I do that freely and very sincerely because it does matter. Like if I impact someone in a way that I didn't want to or intend to, like, like, like that, that matters, but letting, letting them know in a way that's meaningful to them is really important. So I do remember, I won't get into all the details, but like many years ago, um, I needed to talk to our whole staff and just, and let them know, like I've, I've missed some things and it's impacted you. And, and so I start the meeting, George, cause this was a really big deal. And I didn't know what to do. Like, and I said out loud, just in a sincere way, like, I don't know if this is a sit down meeting. Like, do I stand? Do I sit? And do I, or I think I even said, do I, do I crawl under the table? Cause they kind of knew, they kind of knew what we were going to be uh, chatting about. But I just, I just think authentically showing up, it, it sends like, uh, I don't know, authentic ripples into the universe and people around you. And in some way, whether it's subconscious or just by modeling, it makes it safe for them emotionally uh, especially over time, you know, if you, if they know that they can trust you that someday that they could let you know when they're hurting and struggling or something's hard, which is critical because things are really hard and there are actually real tangible things principals can do to help sometimes. So I've had like, obviously, you know, we have people come into our office or call and who are crying or upset and needing help and not knowing what to do and spinning. And, and by me going through that process with our team or a smaller portion of the team, and, and actually, honestly, George, going through the, like the shame that I felt after that, like I should have been more professional. I shouldn't have, you know, whatever. But going through that the next few days and them, like think, things are good. We're good. I, like it was almost like more of a connection. I need to extend the same grace to myself too in those moments of imperfection because when people come in here melting down, I don't judge them the next day. Like I actually feel closer to them. And I, then I'm looking out for ways to maybe lighten the load or support them in a way. So it's fascinating the walls and the masks that we wear and, and that I wear. And when you get around a, a group of people or, you know, a, a friend and you're willing to like let some layers or peel back some of the onion, it's actually a really cool thing that, that can happen. When I was a, a principal, I had my first dog, Kobe. So I got, I, my parents would never let me have a dog. And I said, as soon as I grow up to be an adult, I'm getting a dog. Right. So I signed my first teaching contract, went straight to the SBCA. So literally the day I started teaching, I got a dog, right. I was so excited about this and, uh, had Kobe, um, for about 10 years. And then when I was a principal, uh, I had, I took him, uh, to the vet cause he was sick. And then they're like, he's like, this is, he's more than sick. Like, this is not good. So it's probably, it might be best if you, it's your choice, but it might be best to put them down. And I remember I, I was struggling, like I was really struggling with this cause I was kind of a shock. And I think it was cause I was being blind to what was going on a little bit. And the reason I'm sharing this story 
is because uh, I actually shared, I, I went before uh, I put him down, we went to McDonald's, I got him a cheeseburger and a McFlurry. So like want to have like a one last meal because I was like his favorite and I probably, you know, probably wasn't the best thing to be, but you know, and I had to take it like I took that time to be with him, you know, and like I know if, if my parents didn't understand this, because they were like, just get another dog. <laughs> I was like, mm-hmm. kind of heartless because they never had a dog, right? And and I remember struggling with that and going to school and saying like, hey, I'm not okay right now. This is really tough. And I felt a closeness after, and I feel people saw me, because I was very new at the time. Like, this is very new to me being a principal. I felt that people saw me as a human being that was their principal, not a principal that just happened to be a human being. And it was like a really, it was really a powerful moment for me. And I connected with staff who had dogs and they, you know, like if you've never had a dog, you're like, why are you so upset? But if you had, you probably understand. And that, and I didn't have that weirdly enough with my own family, but I did with some of the teachers and it brought a closeness and I, I shared it openly with my students too. And they were very supportive. And I just remember that. And I, I think that's something that I appreciate when you share about how important that is and how we, you know, like look to the people that we work with because we spend so much time is like people that we can depend on, but we have to be real. We have to share when we struggle and when we're having a hard time. But it's this weird juxtaposition because you want to appear competent and you want to, you want them to trust you professionally and to think highly of you. So it's this weird thing where, oh my gosh, I didn't get X, Y, or Z done. And now I probably don't look as good to that. It's, you know, I get, I get the, the push pull. I got to say a quick thing. So before kids, I was not a dog person and maybe I'm still not, I don't really know. I'm getting there, but it's like, we have a dog now and she's totally a member of the family. And, and, and it just goes to show you'll do anything for your, like, we'll do anything for our kids. And that's why we got it. But um, this is a, obviously a coincidence. And I don't even know. If, oh, can you see this, George? Do you have I have dog custom. That's my dog. Can you see her? Sorry. <laughs> Hold on. There it is. <laughs> oh, that's Willow. She's a golden doodle. Oh, that's nice. My dog. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Wow. I said I was with a. Uh, this is I was with a, like a dog, a I dog podcast. I gotta say dog one dog. more thing. It's about kids. I was with a kindergartner <laughs> in the office today, and we're just connecting and talking. Um, and I, I forget how it came up. She brought up her dog or something, and I'm like, "You want to see a picture of my dog?" She's like, "Yeah." And then I reached down for my socks. She's like, "What's going on here?" And I show her, and she just loved it. And then she goes, "Do you have any kids?" And then she's like, she's looking at my socks still, like. I just have pictures of everyone on my socks. I'm like, so I got her a picture out of my office actually from the wall. She's like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's amazing. Hey, so I wanted to uh, talk to you about this one thing. And, I, and I, I actually wrote about this. I think I wrote about this in Innovator's Mindset. And it really stuck out to me. Uh, you and I were on a panel. And one of the things, I don't know if you remember this. I don't know if you know what I'm about to bring up. And I asked, uh, someone said, because you were talking about all the amazing things they were doing in school. And obviously there's a lot of tech related things that cost money. Right. And someone said, how did you like get that money? I don't know if you, and I'm paraphrasing what I remember saying. And you're like, well, what I did is I like open created an innovation budget and I just moved money there and then had it. Do you remember that conversation at all? Yeah, I mean, vaguely, I just be partly probably because it's what we do. But yeah, right. And so the, the so the one of the misperceptions, and I think this is um, something that I think is important to address is that what you saw, it, this is something I, I despise. And I hate when people say this is like, we well, don't need managers, we need leaders. I'm like, well, you need both, actually. Mm-hmm. Because the and the, the 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 idea behind that is that you can talk about vision all you want. You can talk about all these amazing things. But if you actually don't put the tools in place to make those things happen, which is management, right? And the Covey line is basically leadership is about people, management is about stuff, but you have to take care of both, right? And so like, just kind of think, I don't know if you remember that, but like, can you kind of walk people through that? Like, like, did, is that true? Like you allocated, you know, it's not like you got money from a separate place. You just said, Hey, we got to figure out what's, 
what right. we value and then, you know, align our budget with that. Yeah. And I don't know what panel we were on. It might've been the Michigan one, but yeah, anyway, I, I was it. Okay. So I was recently looking at like cleaning out my Google drive and I saw either video or a photo from that. And man, George, we looked like babies in that picture. We've grown up a little bit from then. I grew my um, hair out since then. <laughs> yeah. And my, I've gone silver blonde since then. So on the, like the budget thing, like trying to apply leadership to the things we're managing, like it just kept coming up all the time. Like can I, I want to try this. Do we have money for that? And so often it's like, well, not really like, or gosh, we're going to have to either ask the PTA or try for a grant. And that just didn't seem to be an right. effective way to like live out your priorities. So one year we tried, we like created a small line item and just shifted funds around. So obviously we reprioritized the budget, but, but it gave us a small, a modest line item for innovation. And the mindset change that that allowed us to do. So then as teachers are coming up to me, um, the answer was, it was a completely different conversation. Like, oh, we could tap into this or, oh, with either like part of the building allocation or your grade level or department allocation, pairing that, you know, if it's a priority for us and for you, pairing that with our in innovation budget, we might be able to do X, Y, or Z. And it just opened up so many different things. And it actually grew, um, Here's a, the next iteration since, since that book, what we did to that, George, is I was noticing that a lot of people tapped into that, but not everyone, because some people are just high flying, cruising, or don't have the time, or don't maybe right. don't feel comfortable asking, like whatever the barrier. So then we started this, like, it's called a grant, but it tapped into that budget, like one sentence grant. Give me a sentence with what you want to do for kids. And, you know, obviously it'll connect to like what, what our vision and, and, and who we are but we will like mobilize it and we will try to fund it and work with you. So that was a way to like break down the walls to the budget. Cause a lot of school budgets are kind of mysterious. I think to teachers they are not super right. transparent and they're just, they're just something that's there. Um, but that was that the response to that, like the first year we had several requests the year after the year after it was just like people asking for really incredible impactful stuff. And if I'm being, like super reflective on it. A lot of what they asked for might have been stuff that I might have tried to hope to talk people into or say, right. hey, we should pay attention to it. But they they know, like right. they just sometimes just need the the support and the access. So, so that's the story story behind the story. So for people listening, what give me an, and I'm putting you on the spot here. Give me an example of like what a one sentence proposal was. Like what would that look like? Oh sure. I mean it could range from uh, you gotta books. say, you gotta say a sentence. What is it? Oh, yeah. Um, someone, someone, I like, want this is why to, I'm asking this. Somebody want, listening to this and they're like, I want to do that in my school. Yeah. 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 I need there's that. No, I need the there's no, example. yeah, yeah. There's no, and by the way, this is just how I am. Anyone listening, feel free to contact me and I'll even share the email that I send our staff and it'll lay it out for you. You know, oh, if you want to, if you want to look at it, but it's as basic as I want to provide book access to my kids because here's what I'm noticing, it, right. you know, solving a problem that they've noticed. It's like, all right, let's have that conversation. And it's so, so in using that example, like this wasn't just drones or robotics or coding software, although so, some of that stuff was a part of it, but it was right. also, you know, literacy and flexible furniture and, you know, the list go, yeah, what the list goes on and on and on. And, and you and I have a very similar idea behind the notion of innovation. It's not about technology. It's about doing new and better teaching, right? Like it's, it's, and it, but it's really important. It has to be better. It just can't be cool stuff. Right. And I think that that's, that's important to me. Um, you also, we mentioned at the beginning, you're an author, right? And you have uh, two books out as far as I know that are solely published by you. One is, or solely written by you. One is Renegade Leadership. And the other one is reclaiming our calling. So renegade leadership. Mm -hmm. What is that? What, what, what is the premise of the book? So renegade leadership builds on what you just said that meaningful change doesn't have to be plugged in or battery operated or flashy. So really it's like infusing pedagogy and, and the red it's driven by the renegade code C O D E. So, so, you know, collaboration, ownership of the people closest to the work, digital connectivity, and then experiential learning, like the things that I think we would want our kids to have, that's the code, underpinned by relationships. But like, it's a tool that leaders can use, like with the one sentence 
grant concept and the line item for innovation, like if you look at the code, it's alive and well in that decision making process. It's not just rolling over the same budget that my predecessor had and their predecessor had 20 years ago, because by the way, that happens in schools too, but it's really looking right. like, what would this thing look like if it were more, if the process or the budget was more collaborative and the people closest to the work owned it more, or there was more student ownership, et cetera, et cetera. So in a nutshell, George, that's renegade leadership. Okay. So how does it right now with schools being all over the place, how do you think that the concepts in that book apply to right now? So I think, I think there's a lot of just what you said, but like, how do you explicitly connect those, those concepts? It's fascinating because even during the, the pandemic and even when I was like quarantined at home, I actually found myself going back to the book and that sounds probably really weird, but it's so alive and well and important and the reminders that, that I needed. So surprisingly, even though it doesn't mention COVID-19 or the pandemic, obviously, because it was written before, like, thankfully for right now, that book has a shelf life that's alive and well. And that's the beauty of like a concept, like having people, having kiddos own their work and their thinking, having teachers uh, be able to own like a lot of the decisions and input processes in a school, like, like that's such an important concept that I think will be really important tomorrow and a year from now and two years from now too. So we just gave examples of what it looked like and, and how to do it if other people are interested in doing it. And by the way, you wrote the forward for that. So thank you um, for that. Hey, my pleasure, man. So reclaiming our calling. Yeah. And you, when, when we talked about it and you published that uh, with Impress, you talked about this book being your heart. I remember that specifically. Tell a little bit about the notion of reclaim air calling. And I, I think part, part of the reason I think it's really important book right now is I feel a lot of educators feel really are struggling with their, you know, with education and rightfully so. And I understand that. And I think that book reminds us why we do what we do. Yeah. So reclaiming our calling. And then the, the subtitle is hold on to the heart, hope, and mind of education. So really, George, the most powerful thing about that book is it's like, it, it brings the power of relationships and story to life in a way that I think affirms the things that are being affronted on so many levels in classrooms and, and offices across the country. Like, here's an example. When we start to make decisions based on scores before seeing the actual human beings who are either helping to like facilitate the teaching and learning or showing like this pandemic is a perfect example. Like in the coming months, our, the US State Department is gonna have to make some important decisions about, are we going to mandate testing for right. all kids and, and why? And, and I know there are pros and cons to everything, but when you think about um, the humanity and the human beings and what they've been through and then what you're gonna ask them to do, like those right. are really important considerations. So the book is about like everything we do should go back to thinking about the people doing the work. And then it's stories that it's stories, anecdotes, quotes and tools to, to affirm, but to like to challenge yeah. and to push you do it better. And that like, like there's some brain science sprinkled in, and I think a pretty accessible, simple way. Cause that's all I, that's all I really got for you, but like <laughs> things to confront, uh, like blind spots that you might have, or right. making sure you're not on autopilot. Cause we are all susceptible to, to, to those things too. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I was just having this conversation and I talk about this a lot is that you and I both believe relationships are really important. Uh, we also understand there's a reality with standardized tests and that's something that's, you know, even if they're gone this year, they probably won't be gone the following year. Right. And I would like to see shifts to something that, you know, makes, you know, we, there's gotta be some space, like what replaces that. And I think that's a conversation that's really important. Um, to say like, how do we know if a school is being effective? I think there's much more powerful ways. I've talked about portfolios, things like that, but you, I, I, I truly believe if you, as you're talking about, and I've shared is that if you focus on those relationships, usually the tests are fine, but we sometimes, and I think this is a part of leadership is that we so focus and I shouldn't say leadership as much as I'd say administrators, because it's not always, it's not always the same term right? Is that if you focus so much on the tests, even in a year that they're, you know, maybe we don't have the obstacles that we're facing this year, 
you're we're losing a lot of people because of this because it's not why we got an education right because i feel it's becoming just a thing of ranking and sorting and not only can be demoralizing to teachers but to kids too right like that's yeah and there's another aspect of that like for example if if teachers for for whatever reason don't feel physically or mentally safe to come into a school but we're giving more emphasis on a test and procedures to to safeguard like the validity of the the results and stuff like that's a that's a blaring discrepancy that i don't want to be a part of like if if this one thing matters a lot then we better live out that this other thing matters just as much as well so in in reclaim air calling like the core of the calling we actually drill down into like what is the core so if we were to try to make relationships kind of a tangible thing that make a difference for kids and we wanted to teach like a new principal or teacher or affirm the great work that that experienced people are doing like it breaks down through through stories and some research and stuff the different layers and they ultimately drill down to what i call transcendent learning or learning that lasts so that it's yes the kiddos will do well on a test but it's also something that will matter to them and they'll be able to solve problems like 20 years from now which you know, there's a lot of research out there right now, and there's like this hundred year old high school study that sh- shares how much high school kiddos retain mm-hmm. after four hours and then after a week. And it is absent relationships and relevance and things like that. It's it's embarrassingly low. So reclaiming our calling confronts that reality and it kind of affirms and brings to life like, so what are we currently doing about it? What are educators across the country and world doing about it and 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 who do we want to be and how are we going to get there with lots of stories and practical like uh like a pathway for it yeah and and for me if you focus on developing kids as powerful learners they will do fine on the tests but if you focus on kids doing well on tests it doesn't mean they'll be powerful learners right and i think Mm -hmm. that we have to have that understanding is like really we've been talking about this whole notion of like lifelong learning, we have to understand this is not a new concept to education. This is something that when I was a kid, they talked about in school, but we also have to understand the opportunities that we have are much different from when I went to school, right? Like the school, when I went, when I went was the place for information, like literally not only the teacher's knowledge, um, but the library was there. That's like, there was a, we had a public library in our town, but it was only open for, you know, a few hours after school, uh, if I, and I honestly didn't go there anyway, but I'm just saying, um, but now we have access to different things. So what does it mean to be a lifelong learner in this time where we're, um, we have so much information and, and how do we get things to stick out? The- hey George, I got to say one other thing about that. So last night we had our get ready for K event, which is basically preschoolers, incoming kindergartners, you, you welcome them. And we did it by zoom and had over hundred people, hundred families on the zoom. And like, as we were sharing our heart for learning and this work and like who we are as a school community, I actually attributed a quote to you. I hope you said it. I know I've like learned and gleaned this from you and I gave you credit, George. So if you didn't say it, I'll have to retract it. But I just said, we want, we want, we want your future kindergartner to leave school more curious than when, when they come and when they arrive. And then I gave example after example, showing photos and stories and like how our school is built and structured that gets kids to that point. And then I culminated in a story, um, which, you know, it's a fifth grader and I showed a picture. I had walked into her classroom. And the reason I shared with these potential kindergarten families is I wanted them to see like, what does, what does, what does vision and action, all the, everything that our team is working on, what does that lead to? So I walk into this fifth grade classroom and there's this kind of mess on the floor, some magnets and popsicle sticks. And I asked the girl, I'm like, oh, you know, what's that? Other than, other than a mess. And she looks up at me and she says, well, I'm building a, a, a highway that doesn't, the, the vehicle doesn't use power. It uses magnetism. She said it so much better than I'm saying it now. But, and then I looked again at it. Sure enough, she had constructed a magnetic ho- hovercraft and built a highway for it. So I took a picture of it and I shared the families like that doesn't just happen or start in fifth grade. It happens when a community champions curiosity, just like you said, you know, a little bit ago, much better than I ever could. Yeah. I think that, that it's not just, it's not just pushing our kids' potential, 
but it's creating the space where they feel safe enough to take risks and they're learning to try different things. And you have to do that. Like you can't just do that and say like, Oh, let's do that for kids. You have to do that for your educators too, which is why I know you talk so highly of them. So, and the resources to support that potential. And when I say resources, I'm not just talking money. I'm like talking like time, the people who show up and they're in like, even how they think about mm -hmm. learning, like that's a huge resource and, and asset, maybe, maybe even more important than this sometimes. Okay. So on a personal note, are you a Vikings fan? Yes. Okay. So I got to ask you this. Are you, do you get more excited about a Vikings win or a Packers loss? <laughs> oh, for sure. A Vikings win. Are you sure? Like, like Joe Sanfilippo yeah. talks about Green Bay Packers. And I'll tell you watching the Packers lose because Joe Sanfilippo talks so much smack. I know last weekend it was kind of, I know. I'm going to admit something that, that most Vikings fans might not admit, but I, I also appreciate like excellence in franchises and Aaron football Rogers. teams and players. The Packers organization over the years is like, it yeah. epitomizes excellence to me. So therefore when the Vikings are out in January, which they usually are out in January, um, I might be like cheering for green and gold. So. So you're so yeah, and that's like I I I love Aaron Rodgers. I'm a Bears fan. Um, I think it was just more to make fun of Joe Sanfilippo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean that's a, that's a fun. Okay, thing. so what, what's like, the, look? Is that your sport? Is football like the the main thing you're interested in? Yeah. That, well, I have so many like that I love. That's my favorite professional sport. Here's a new thing that our school's done for the last couple of years. Is this on your socks? No, 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 no. Pickleball. Have you heard of this, George? Hey, it is the absolute best. So we get together, you know, we have a net in school. Sometimes we go to local parks and like teachers of all ages, Pickle. men, women, all athletic abilities, like people who pull muscles, just breathing like myself. And it is so, so fun. So George, I'm telling you, you have got to try it. And if you're Pickle. ever in Minnesota, we, we should play. Mark my words, write it down. You got uh pickle pickleball. What is, why is it called pickleball? I believe like 50 years ago or so, there was a guy in his, at a campground who wanted to invent a sport and something about his dog brought him a ball. Like it's something like that, something crazy like that. It doesn't have anything to do with pickles. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, everybody. Uh, pickleball. <laughs> oh. <laughs> See, yeah, clearly, I'm sure it's played. awesome. You've I'm sure it's played. awesome. I'm sure it's awesome. Anyways, Brad, hey, I know I took a lot of time this afternoon. We had a great conversation. It was nice to catch up with you. And uh, if you want, you're going to see uh, links to Brad's books in the description below. Uh, also, where to connect with him uh, through social media. I personally have learned a ton from you, Brad. Uh, and I'm glad that you stuck around to learn from me, even after <laughs> I uh, kind of pulled you aside and challenged you on your presentation before you gave it. This is that's why you don't one. actually, that's why you don't put the presentation description in things because people will read them and then say, Oh, I actually don't agree with you. <laughs> before it. Your, your, your next, your next frontier is pickleball, George. That's all. That's, Pick, pickleball. That's okay. So yep. everyone listening uh, in the comments below, tell us who your favorite pickleball player is <laughs> in professional pickleball. Please. So anyways, Brad, thanks for a wonderful uh, chat. Please connect with Brad and thanks for watching everybody. Have a wonderful day.